Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is November 29, 2020. And this is an audiobook of The Historical Destiny of the Doctrine of Karl Marx by Vladimir Lenin. This audiobook is part of the 26 part series Basic Marxism Leninism Study Course. You can find that playlist on our channel. And that curriculum was originally put out by the MAI, Anti-Imperialist Movement. So this essay was originally published in Pravda No. 50, March 1, 1913, signed VI, and published here according to that Pravda text. The source is Lenin, Collected Works, Progress Publishers, 1975, Moscow, Volume 18. Translated by Stepan Apression, transcription by Zodiac, HTML by Brian Baggins and D. Walters, and it's in the public domain, Lenin Internet Archive, 1996. Thanks, as usual, to Marxists Internet Archive, Marxists.org, which hosts this for free. Please go check out their site. They have thousands of Marxist texts for free online. Now into the audiobook. The chief thing in the doctrine of Marx is that it brings out the historic role of the proletariat as the builder of socialist society. Has the course of events all over the world confirmed this doctrine since it was expounded by Marx? Marx first advanced it in 1844. The Communist Manifesto of Marx and Engels, published in 1848, gave an integral and systematic exposition of this doctrine, an exposition which has remained the best to this day. Since then, world history has been clearly divided into three main periods. One, from the Revolution of 1848 to the Paris Commune, 1871. Two, from the Paris Commune to the Russian Revolution, 1905. Three, since the Russian Revolution. Let us see what has been the destiny of Marx's doctrine in each of these periods. 1. At the beginning of the first period, Marx's doctrine by no means dominated. It was only one of the very numerous groups or trends of socialism. The forms of socialism that did dominate were in the main akin to our narrativism, in comprehension of the materialist basis of historical movement, inability to single out the role and significance of each class in capitalist society, concealment of the bourgeois nature of democratic reforms under diverse quasi-socialist phrases about the people, justice, right, and so on. The revolution of 1848 struck a deadly blow at all these vociferous, motley, and ostentatious forms of pre-Marxian socialism. In all countries, the revolution revealed the various classes of society in action. The shooting of the workers by the Republican bourgeoisie in Paris in the June days of 1848 finally revealed that the proletariat alone was socialist by nature. The liberal bourgeoisie dreaded the independence of this class a hundred times more than it did any kind of reaction. The craven liberals groveled before reaction. The peasantry were content with the abolition of the survivals of feudalism and joined the supporters of order, wavering but occasionally between workers' democracy and bourgeois liberalism. All doctrines of non-class socialism and non-class politics proved to be sheer nonsense. The Paris Commune, 1871, completed this development of bourgeois changes. The Republic, i.e. the form of political organization in which class relations appear in their most unconcealed form, owed its consolidation solely to the heroism of the proletariat. In all the other European countries, a more tangled and less complete development led to the same result, a bourgeois society that had taken definite shape. Towards the end of the first period, 1848 to 71, a period of storms and revolutions, pre-Marxian socialism was dead. Independent proletarian parties came into being, the First International, 1864 to 72, and the German Social Democratic Party. 2. The second period, 1872 to 1904, was distinguished from the first by its, quote, peaceful character, by the absence of revolutions. The West had finished with bourgeois revolutions. The East had not yet risen to them. The West entered a phase of, quote, peaceful preparations for the changes to come. Socialist parties, basically proletarian, were formed everywhere and learned to use bourgeois parliamentarism 
and to found their own daily press, their educational institutions, their trade unions, and their cooperative societies. Marx's doctrine gained a complete victory and began to spread. The selection and mustering of the forces of the proletariat and its preparation for the coming battles made slow but steady progress. The dialectics of history were such that the theoretical victory of Marxism compelled its enemies to disguise themselves as Marxists. Liberalism, rotten within, tried to revive itself in the form of socialist opportunism. They interpreted the period of preparing the forces for great battles as renunciation of these battles. Improvement of the conditions of the slaves to fight against wage slavery, they took to mean the sale by the slaves of their right to liberty for a few pence. They cravenly preached, quote, social peace, i.e. peace with the slave owners, renunciation of the class struggle, etc. They had very many adherents among socialist members of parliament, various officials of the working class movement, and the, quote, sympathizing intelligentsia. Three, however, the opportunists had scarcely congratulated themselves on, quote, social peace and on the non-necessity of storms under, quote, democracy when a new source of great world storms opened up in Asia. The Russian Revolution was followed by revolutions in Turkey, Persia, and China. It is in this era of storms and their, quote, repercussions in Europe that we are now living. No matter what the fate of the great Chinese Republic, against which various, quote, civilized hyenas are now wetting their teeth, no power on earth can restore the old serfdom in Asia or wipe out the heroic democracy of the masses in the Asiatic and semi-Asiatic countries. Certain people who were inattentive to the conditions for preparing and developing the mass struggle were driven to despair and to anarchism by the lengthy delays in the decisive struggle against capitalism in Europe. We can now see how short-sighted and faint-hearted this anarchist despair is. The fact that Asia, with its population of 800 million, has been drawn into the struggle for these same European ideals should inspire us with optimism and not despair. The Asiatic revolutions have again shown us the spinelessness and baseness of liberalism, the exceptional importance of the independence of the democratic masses, and the pronounced demarcation between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie of all kinds. After the experience both of Europe and Asia, Anyone who speaks of non-class politics and non-class socialism ought simply to be put in a cage and exhibited alongside the Australian kangaroo or something like that. After Asia, Europe has also begun to stir, although not in the Asiatic way. The, quote, peaceful period of 1872 to 1904 has passed, never to return. The high cost of living and the tyranny of the trusts are leading to an unprecedented sharpening of the economic struggle which has set into movement even the British workers who have been most corrupted by liberalism. We see a political crisis brewing even in the most, quote, diehard bourgeois junker country, Germany. The frenzied arming and the policy of imperialism are turning modern Europe into a, quote, social peace, which is more like a gunpowder barrel. Meanwhile, the decay of all the bourgeois parties and the maturing of the proletariat are making steady progress. Since the appearance of Marxism, each of the three great periods of world history has brought Marxism new confirmation and new triumph. But a still greater triumph awaits Marxism as the doctrine of the proletariat in this coming period of history. End of audiobook. So that was a quick one. Again, this is 1913 before, of course, um, the you know, revolution of 1917 in Russia, and then the subsequent civil war, which led to the establishment of the socialist state, Soviet Russia, and the founding of the USSR. But there are a few things, uh, just to comment quickly, that stand out to me in reading this in 2020. So one of the first ones was when Lenin talked about opportunism. So he wrote, the dialectics of history were such that the theoretical victory of Marxism compelled its enemies to disguise themselves as Marxists. Liberalism, rotten within, tried to revive itself in the form of socialist opportunism. So in other words, Marxism had shown itself to many, many proletarians that it was correct. It was capable of predicting history, that its grasp on capitalism 
was strong and correct and, you know, compelling, convincing. Uh, so the liberals, you know, losing the ideological battle had to basically pretend to be Marxists. But then uh, they couldn't, of course, actually promote Marxism. They had to promote a watered down, corrupted version of Marxism that, uh, of course, you know, would just lead the workers back into slavery. We see a massive trend toward this today. The rise of BreadTube. Uh, BreadTube is a little bit anarchist, but a lot of it is, you know, social democrat or democratic socialist. I mean, the the line is is blurry between those two, and especially the radlip, the liberal who uses some amount of radical rhetoric to disguise their liberalism. So opportunism is basically when Marxists work with people who they shouldn't work with, people who have fundamental differences of class interest. In other words, it's working with liberals. You really can't do it. The liberals are going to sell you out. It's not really in their interest to work with you except to deceive you, and that's all that they'll do. We have seen this, unfortunately, now twice with Bernie Sanders. Uh, I, here at Socialism for All, was willing to be part of the left wing of the Bernie Sanders coalition in an effort to try to propel, well, to do the opposite of this, actually, to attack liberalism from within uh, one of these you know, class peace movements, to basically say, yes, we want change, and actually Bernie's not going far enough. The squad and you know, most of the justice Democrats who are trying to reform and rebuild the liberal wing of the Democratic Party while using socialist language, you know, talking about FDR, who saved capitalism and was a social democrat, just a reform capitalist, as some kind of socialist, this is not what we need. FDR is why we're having the 2020 we're having, because he saved capitalism with the class piece. So despite some recent comments by AOC that everything that she's tried to do in the Democratic Party hasn't worked, etc., that you know basically the Democratic Party is a dead end, which I took as possibly, you know, optimistic uh, or viewed in an optimistic light as possibly good news that, hey, maybe AOC is going to start telling people to dem exit because that's really what we need people to do. You just can't work within a bourgeois party effectively as a socialist unless, I mean, the only thing you can really do there is to go in, as I was just talking about, and try to attack liberalism, uh, but not to work with it as you know, for example, the squad just voted to make Nancy Pelosi, who has been starving Americans uh, by, you know, failing to pass <laughs> emergency pandemic aid for months now. They just voted to make her House Speaker again. So opportunism, rad liberty, uh, Lenin was writing about it in 1913. This is what liberals do when socialism, actual Marxists, you know, promoting actual socialism as we are, start to become more popular. Um, they basically just claim that they are socialists uh, and use their money to, you know, basically drown us out in the media. So the other uh, topic here in point three, Lenin writes, however, the opportunists had scarcely congratulated themselves on, quote, social peace and on the non-necessity of storms under, quote, democracy, when a new source of great world storms opened up in Asia. So in other words, uh, what is the social peace? Class peace, class truce. This is basically when the capitalists, feeling that they are sufficiently threatened, decide to say, hey, let's draw up a truce. You know, uh, the, the, the New Deal in the mid-1930s in the United States is a great example of this. It's like, oh, we just had a decade of the coal wars in the 1920s, which was the largest conflict since the Civil War. Uh, which was basically people trying to resist, um, you know, the invasion of the the coal miners, capitalists uprooting people from the land in Appalachia, and uh, you know, and just um, broad labor union activity all across the United States in the 1900s, 19-teens, 1920s. FDR's faction of the ruling class, and he was absolutely a one percenter, said, you know, uh, let's throw these people a bone, we'll draw up a class piece, and then that will greatly diminish the threat of revolution. Now, capitalists, of course, at any time can do this. I mean, Lenin has pointed out in other works that it's actually incredibly cheap for capitalists to make some concessions. You know, by just paying 0.5% of their 
wealth. They can buy off the working class with remarkable ease. The fact that they crushed Bernie Sanders as hard as they did, uh, to me, speaks to, I mean, both their, of course, extreme arrogance, but possibly also to their fear that at this point things are so unstable and it may actually be the end of the line for capitalism that uh, they don't they're almost afraid to make concessions now, fearing that people will just overrun them. That's entirely possible. I mean, that was basically my proposal as far as working within the Bernie Sanders movement, is that we use that to sort of get a leg up for actual socialism. Who knows? Uh, all I do know is that given the two options, option A being leave the people who are currently in power in power, the people who hate us, have a long history of systemic violence against us, who have diametrically opposed interests to us, and who have the power to basically retract and extend offers at will, uh, and we have almost no counterpower against it, leave them in power but try to get a few concessions from them, versus option B, throw them out and we take power. Why would anyone really take option A? Of course, it might seem more daunting to do option B, but of course it's more desirable. Getting people to admit that, getting working people to admit that it is more desirable that we just take power is clearly, clearly a a positive first step. If you can get somebody to at least own that desire, that's key. That's key and may lead to changes down the line, which I guess leads me to my concluding point. Lenin talks about uh, despair and delay leading to anarchism, quote, Certain people who were inattentive to the conditions for preparing and developing the mass struggle were driven to despair and to anarchism by the lengthy delays in the decisive struggle against capitalism in Europe. Now, here in 2020, there still haven't been any revolutions in the advanced, most advanced capitalist countries of Western Europe and North America. And a great deal of socialist-minded people have been driven to anarchism. I may be doing more of a response to anarchism video at some point. A viewer actually just recommended that I look at a video series called The State is Counter-Revolutionary by a channel called Anarch. Uh, I did start to watch it. It's a horrible series of videos, in my opinion. It's very, very typical uh, collection of mischaracterizations, misunderstandings, and probable, um, you know, purposeful uh, straw manning you know, deliberate misrepresentation of Marxist-Leninist viewpoints. But if an impatience with revolution combined with decades of anti-socialist propaganda, which unfortunately many anarchists haven't seemed to recognize as such, has driven as many people as it has in the West to anarchism, that's a thing that we really need to start to combat. And that's a reason I'm doing socialism for all. I've thoroughly looked at anarchism contemplated it, turned it over in my mind, and rejected it. There's just no way forward there. But again, that's a video for another time. This has been an audiobook of Lenin's Historical Destiny of the Doctrine of Karl Marx. Thanks to our current patrons for November 2020, whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to become a patron, you can do so at patreon.com slash socialism for all. We're also rebuilding the Facebook page at facebook.com slash socialism, the number four all Please like, subscribe, comment, all that kind of stuff. And here on the channel on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and the notifications bell. Like, share, comment, spread it to your Discord groups, Reddit servers, and wherever else you're online. Thanks, and we'll see you in the next video.